Good afternoon to our viewers in Germany and good morning to our viewers in the United States. Hello, I'm Steve Sokol, the president of the American Council on Germany, and I'd like to welcome you to today's Kaffeepause. At each Kaffeepause, we check in with a journalist based in Germany to talk about the news stories behind the headlines. And today I'm delighted to welcome Bojan Panchevsky back to the Café Pause again. He's the Wall Street Journal's Germany correspondent. And Bojan, thank you so much for joining us. There's a lot to discuss. Hi there. Always a pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Well, I'm I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. And, and I thought, you know, for a change that we could really start with um, the foreign policy arena before we drill down on a couple of domestic issues. Um, because there's there's so much happening, it seems, uh, at the, the top of the news day today. Um, over the weekend, the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz was in Paris. Uh, he and French President Emmanuel Macron had dinner together, but Scholz left Paris before China's President Xi Jinping arrived in Paris for the first stop of his three city European tour. Um, granted, Scholz was just in China and had a meeting with Xi while he was there, but are you reading anything into this? I mean, not really, to be honest. Uh, the issue is here that um, apparently the invitation for Scholz to join uh, this event with uh, President Macron and the President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, came a little bit late in the day. That's not unheard of when it comes to the Elysee Palace, the, the presidential administration. It seems like either Macron or whoever else made, made up their mind kind of late and extended that invitation to the German Chancellor, who already had prior commitments. Uh, he is today, I think, in the Baltics. He's visiting um, German allies there, Lithuania, uh, for example. Germany is going to station a whole um, unit, military unit there, to serve as a kind of a tripwire against the possible Russian aggression. So the German chancellor couldn't really cancel that appointment, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's just, it's just, uh, it's just that. I mean. I, you know, some people have said, well, maybe he could have made time or whatever. And who knows? Maybe he didn't want necessarily to participate in this thing because uh, there's always a, a touch of controversy when uh, European leaders are meeting Xi Jinping no nowadays uh, for various reasons, especially for Germany. That's been the case because Germany has this really extremely strong trade links uh, and some would say economic dependency on China. But I think in this particular case, I wouldn't I wouldn't really discuss it for too long because it's essentially it was an agenda issue, uh, and and it 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 is what it is. It, I don't think it's a major issue of geopolitical kind of <laughs> significance that he's not he's not going. It's it's good to hear your assessment of that because I think it it calms things down a little bit on some of the reporting that I had heard um, earlier today. There seemed to be some concern particularly as as Macron tries to to show a united European front vis-a-vis -vis China um, and you know having as you said was a von der Leyen there as well um, it does send an important message um, not having Scholz there could perhaps weaken that message um, but one of the analysis that I saw was that you know Germany because of its strong economic ties with China might have somewhat different priorities from other European countries when it comes to developing a position on China. How, how aligned do you see Paris and Berlin when it comes to China? Well, I mean, that is a very interesting and, and very complicated question. I think essentially, um, if we focus on France for a quick moment, uh, French policy has forever been, ever since uh, uh, General de Gaulle was president, was a kind of a French-European sovereignty vis-a-vis -vis America, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the then kind of Soviet bloc, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the rest of the world. And I think that hasn't really changed much. And, and, and uh, Macron has been defining a new policy of European sovereignty, which kind of recently he called in a interview with The Economist for re-industrialization of Europe. He said it was a mistake to de-industrialize France and by extension Europe and to move over production to Southeast Asia, notably China. You know, a bunch of factories migrated from Europe, like from America as well, to China. And now China is the industrial powerhouse of the world, whereas Europe doesn't even have enough 
industrial capacity to produce plastic gloves, which ran out in the pandemic, including Mm -hmm. also masks, also ammunition, as we now find out, you know, the collective West is not able to produce as many shells as Russia is. So this this is a concern for the Russian uh, for for the French president and he says we need to bring some, some of that back so we shouldn't be too dependent too de- reliant on China. At the same time, you know, he invites he rolls out the red carpet for for Xi Jinping, the the leader of China. He went on a state visit to Beijing uh, last year. He was was it last year? Yeah. He was yeah. welcomed there as 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 a kind of a real sovereign. You know, there was a three day kind of celebration of the relationship. There was a lot of pomp and circumstance. I think he visibly enjoyed it, and so I think overall it's fair to say that the way America under President Trump and later under President Biden and probably in the next term of President Biden or the President Trump, whoever wins is moving away from this transatlantic partnership a little bit, is focusing on 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 Asia, is certainly um, in a very tense um, rivalry with China. And that's not in Europe's interest necessarily to come between Mm -hmm. China and and, and America. And it doesn't seem the case for Europe to want to join one of these blocks either. So I think the Europeans are kind of pushed again, into a policy of, of maintaining this balance of a relationship between America, the kind of the, the big brother, the, the senior partner of this transatlantic coalition, and, and China, which is a major economic partner, but also increasingly a major partner for everything related to world affairs. You know, the war in Ukraine, China is a quintessential collocutor for every European leader who wants to kind of achieve something you know, uh, Middle East, Iran, you name it, you know, nuclear threat. Climate. When Putin was, yeah, climate, of course, is the major issue where nothing goes without China. You know, when Putin was was um, issuing these nuclear threats against Ukraine, uh, the collective West reached out to China and asked President Xi Jinping to tell his partner Putin to stop it. And Olaf Scholz actually was the one who succeeded in in, in achieving that formally, at least uh, during a trip to Beijing. Um, so um, I think the fact of the matter is Europe is is um, quite reliant on its relationship to China and has no intention of majorly downgrading that relationship. Mm-hmm. I think there is a lot of talk of de-risking yeah. And certainly the French are pretty strong on that because they, their risk is not as high as the German risk because German car makers and, and big chemical uh, companies, for example, are absolutely invested in China. I mean, some in some cases, over 50% of their revenue comes from China. And I'm talking about car makers specifically now. And that's the future for them. Uh, there's no question about it. And so the government must kind of uh, tiptoe a fine line there. I think the de-risking mentality has arrived to Germany as well. I mean, they definitely think they are overexposed to China, but they ob- obviously have no no interest of winding winding that relationship down. And it wouldn't even be possible. I mean, the German chancellor can do very little to tell the CEO of Volkswagen to get uh, to get out of China. You know, it's just not going to yeah. happen. And of course, um, Ursula von der Leyen underscored de-risking over decoupling again today in the run up to the visit by by Xi. I guess, um, you know, obviously, as you've outlined, the relationship with China is important across Europe. um, And there it's a very complex situation in terms of of who is dealing with China on on what level. Um, But I find it interesting that she's visit two, three European cities, countries um, is is also sort of a conscious decision. He's not going to be in Brussels. He's not going to be in Berlin. Of course, Scholz just visited. He's not going to Italy. Um, He will be in France and then in Serbia and Hungary. And of course, Serbia and Hungary are are two countries that are somewhat um, friendly with Russia um, and not necessarily on the same side as much of the rest of Europe when it comes to the the conflict in Ukraine. Um, Do you think that this is supposed to send a message to the rest of Europe? Well, I don't think so much it's a message for the rest of Europe. Uh, I think uh, it's it's uh, China wanting to fortify these relationships that it has. So the, the visit to France is a visit to France primarily, and then it's a visit to the European Union. Obviously, von der Leyen is there, mm-hmm. and it would, be, it would be a forum for important discussions. 
And then the visit to Hungary is a visit to Hungary. You know, Hungary within the European Union is the only remaining country that still sticks to this Belt and Road malarkey. You know, they're still kind of interested in 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 a, in a much more profound relationship with with China. All the other countries that were initially very keen on that have over the years seen that no money is coming from China, and that's what they were interested in, money. Yeah. So if they're not getting that, they're not interested. So they kind of bailed out one by one. Even Italy, which was kind of wobbling, realized there's no real Chinese investment coming or forthcoming. And so that was the end of it. But however, um, I think Viktor Orban, the prime minister, the long-standing prime minister of, of Hungary, is kind of... Uh, sees himself as as a person who can sit on all chairs. You know, he pursues a policy of almost non-alignment, although he's a member of the EU and NATO, which is, you know, interesting. But he pursues a very cordial relationship with Putin and certainly with Xi Jinping, in as much that Xi Jinping is kind of perceiving him as an equal. It's a very small economy, obviously, uh, Hungary. But we have seen a bunch of uh, Chinese investments, you know, like... Uh, uh, Hungary is essentially a workshop for the German auto industry. It's firmly integrated in the German supply chain. And the Hungarian government is panicking somewhat because uh, the writing's on the wall for um, German car manufacturers. They haven't really done the kind of electric transition very well. They are struggling a little bit with it. And and even if they succeed, you know, um, manufacturing electric vehicles is much more uh, simple and straightforward than producing sort of... Uh, traditional cars and you don't need that many workers you don't need that many factories and so on and so the the, the the hungarians were shopping around for investment you know so they were going to to southeast asia they were going to china they were going to korea and i think both of these countries china and korea specifically south korea that is have have made some sort of considerable yeah. investments now in hungary that's quite interesting and i think uh the, hungary is perfectly willing to kind of be pro china pro uh whatever you know uh and uh, and i think xi jinping is going there to solidify that that relationship and you know some more hawkish analysts have said that you know hungary is turning itself into a trojan horse for china and russia i mean obviously you can debate how much that is true or how much they're just pursuing their own interests brazenly and i think that's what they're doing and in a way that the same is true for serbia you know serbia is not in the european mm -hmm. union it's a country candidate to join eventually the european union but that event if it ever takes place is 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 quite remote it looks quite remote from today's perspective um they are truly a non-aligned country um they are pursuing a very very uh, close relationship with both china and uh, and uh, russia while the european union is by far their biggest trading partner mm -hmm. uh, and they're also recipients of some sort of pre-accession european funds courtesy of the taxpayer so you know they're in a good place um i think uh, they have a very profound friendship with russia historically culturally you know they share the same religion but at the same time, Serbia has been uh, eagerly supplying uh, weapons and ammunition to Ukraine. Uh, mm -hmm. So that there's that, you know, everything has uh, several dimensions to it. You know, uh, Serbia yeah. happens to have a major military industry, especially in the realm of ammunition manufacturing. And they manufacture a type of caliber that, that is uh, crucial to Ukraine. And they were asked by Western allies, America in particular, to export that stuff to them, and they agreed. So they are now, you know, while being best friends with Putin, they are indirectly killing masses of Russian troops on the Ukrainian battlefield by providing this very good, very precise um, artillery shells, among other things. So uh, they are only perfectly, only too happy to be a kind of a Chinese outpost in Europe. Yeah. And if, they, if their economy can profit from it, then that's great. Makes a and lot of sense. In, that, in, the, in their yeah. particular case, they, they also have another interest because China is obviously a member of the permanent member of the Security Council of the United Nations, and Serbia has a long-standing dispute with Kosovo, its former province, yeah. which unilaterally declined declared independence from Serbia. I think in two thousand nine it was, if I'm not mistaken. And ever since, Serbia has been trying to kind of push back against that, and it has been obstructing Kosovo's integration in, into international organizations such as the UN. And so Serbia has an enormous interest in keeping China and Russia on board because the United States and the Western allies are actually supporting Kosovo. 
So Serbia needs to look uh, elsewhere for support for its own agenda. And it's kind of finding that support more or less in Moscow and Beijing. Thanks for that that overview. And obviously, there's a lot more to talk about when it comes to the international dimension. But I'd like to to maybe hone in on the domestic front as well, because there are a couple of stories that are definitely worth following there. Um, according to some of the latest polls, the Christian Democrats are polling at about 30 percent, the alternative for Germany at 18 percent, the Social Democrats at 15 percent. The Greens are down to 12 percent, and the Bundes Sache Wagenknecht, the new party, is already at 7 percent. The Free Democrats are struggling at about 5 percent, and the Linkspartei is below the 5 percent threshold at, at 4 percent. So against this backdrop, with the CDU looking quite strong, um, the, the CDU party conference just started, and it's a three-day event that's taking place in Berlin. Um, in his his opening speech, um, Friedrich Merz, the the head of the of the Christian Democratic Party, um, said that the CDU is is ready to govern, um, and it certainly looks as if, based on those um, uh, opinion polling numbers, as if um, four more years of the traffic light coalition are are unlikely. Um, can you? provide any initial takeaways from the party conference, from the, the Stimmung, from the mood, um, as far as the, the CDU is concerned? Um, I can't really relay the Stimmung because I was watching it on television. I'm only going there tomorrow. I have some meetings on, on, on Tuesday, so uh, I haven't really experienced it live, but I, I watched the relevant speeches. And I think, you know, they're quite uh, happy with themselves. I mean, they're polling at 30% uh, in the poll of polls constantly, consistently. So I think it's pretty uh, it's pretty certain, you know, barring some sort of last minute miracle that the CDU will be the biggest party in the next election and that they will um, appoint the chancellor in a coalition with someone else. Now, the only question is if the polling remains as it is, and it's probably going to kind of be similar to what it is. Uh, the big question is, obviously, who are they going to go into coalition with? And they have only two options. Uh, option one is the Social Democrat Party, the, the current biggest party, the, the party of Chancellor Schultz. And option two is the Green Party, the current junior member in, in, the, in the Ampel, in the, in the traffic light coalition. Um, kind of, uh, it's difficult to know what's worse for the Conservative Party uh, of, of Friedrich Merz. Uh, I mean, uh, there's no love loss between the Social Democrats and the Conservatives or between the Conservatives and the Greens. So I think it will be an exercise of establishing where there is, you know, um, least tension and friction and, and, where, and, and, and who do you hate the least. Um, one has to say that in the past, you know, like 16 years, uh, prior to the the 16 years of Angela Merkel's rule, she mainly governed with the Social Democrats. So that was a constant case of coalitions between the Social Democrats and the Conservatives. Now, a lot of Conservatives who are now at the top of the party and at the time were kind of backbenchers or, or, or a disgruntled minority were not entirely happy with the result of these coalitions. And indeed, the country is in a pretty dire state at the moment. And a lot mm -hmm. of people say uh, these 16 years are largely to blame for the massive problems that Germany is facing today. You know, some of them include um, complete lack of a plan to provide affordable energy to its households and, and industry. And that's largely a function of the country having become addicted to Russian energy, which kind of ceased to flow <laughs> Uh, in a big way after the invasion of Ukraine. And, you know, the country has not been digitized. I mean, it's in the kind of digital stone age compared to much smaller countries like Denmark or uh, even Austria, its immediate neighbor. In Austria, you can get your passport or ID online. You can just kind of um, uh, open a website, type in your contact details and boom. You can even vote online, I think. Whereas in Germany, you have to go somewhere, make an appointment. It will take weeks or not, if not months. Uh, you will receive letters in the post. You have to get a stamp. You know, it's all very Bismarckian, you know, 19th century type of bureaucracy. So a lot of people blame the previous coalitions, which were coalitions of stagnation. Um, so it will be quite difficult for, for Friedrich Merz to argue that a new coalition like that is a great thing for Germany. 
But on the other hand, the alternative will be the Green Party, and the Green Party is in very much in very many ways the kind of um, the polar opposite of what he personally stands for. He's quite you know he's quite keen to tip the conservatives back to the conservative kind of side of things. We, Merkel obviously dragged them into the middle, if not into the left field of politics, and so. Um, He's quite keen on 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 talking tough on migration, for example. He's quite keen on sort of uh, trimming the welfare states, which which is somewhat out of control uh, in Germany, uh, given the fact that Germany is running out of money now. And so it will be a it will be a tough dilemma. But I mean, I wouldn't exclude any of these options. I mean, some people think that you know there's uh, such kind of tension or even hatred between the Greens and the Conservatives that you can't even imagine it. But that's not necessarily true because you know. The primary objective of a party leader is to become a chancellor, and you have to think. You know, everyone should think in pragmatic terms, and because that's how party leaders think, they don't think about ideology much. And I think he will just um, think about what's the best pathway to power, and if the Greens provide it, he will go with the Greens. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I was interested to see uh, over the weekend that that the the head of the CSU, the Christian Social Union. Um, Alexander Dombret uh, basically said that there was absolutely no way that the CDU and CSU could go into a coalition with the Greens, um, that he described the Greens as being the main problem that the traffic light coalition has because of yeah. their ideological policies and the fact that they are polarizing and dividing society. Um, but that could just be jockeying um, where we are right now, more than a year away from federal elections. Than yeah, year. I think we're a long way away. And also, I think that it reflects his personal opinion. Absolutely. I, I, I've met him before, Don Britt, and, and I, I think a lot of people in his party think the same. In fact, a lot of political scientists will tell you that's true as well, mm -hmm. that there is a polarizing effect of the Green Party policies. I mean, for example, they insisted on shutting down the nuclear power plants, which were perfectly fine, yep. you know, the best in the world, one could argue, and they shut them down nonetheless. So now they 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 have to burn coal to make up with that. You know, they're burn, burning coal in Germany like there's no tomorrow, despite the climate <laughs> change yeah. issue. Um, but, uh, you know, politics is politics. And like I said, the only thing uh, Friedrich Merz will care about is how, how he becomes chancellor. And, and uh, he has said privately, and, and I think even publicly, he has praised some of the Green Party figures. Uh, you know, he said of the par of the Green Party co-chairwoman that she is uh, extremely smart and intelligent and impressive. You know, he's he's made some sort of discreet overture, so he hasn't definitely has not closed the door there. With the Social Democrat, the difficulty is that if they were to rejoin government as a junior partner, that's obviously a cue for Olaf Scholz and his entire uh, sort of. Um, uh, top echelon to to just leave because I I can't imagine a scenario whereby Schultz would kind of yield to a chancellor of maths and become yeah. one of his ministers. You know that's that's hard to imagine. So there would have to be a change of the guard in the Social Democrat Party, and then you know we'll have to see how that pans out. And it would largely obviously depend on that. You know if if a kind yeah. of a much more left wing person comes. To, to the helm of the Social Democrats, that's, you know, not going to be uh, a great incentive for Friedrich Merz to set up a government with them. No, but, but it, know, it, it could be an opportunity for sort of the next generation, somebody like Lars Klingbeil, to be in a, a position of, of leadership. Oh, certainly. I mean, people have talked about also about uh, Pistorius, the current defense minister. He's, in fact, the most popular by far uh, yeah. German politician in all the polls. Uh, he he's a long-standing member of the Social Democrat Party, but you know the question is: Does he have the network? Does he have what it takes to kind of uh, grab yeah, power yeah. when the time comes? Does Lars Klingbeil have that? Does he have the personality? Does he have the kind of gravitas? Will he be swept away if if Schultz is swept away? Will will he be swept away too as part of that kind of purge? That will be inevitable, I think. So it's it's far too early to know all these things, and of course, at the end of the day, we don't really know. I mean, Scholz managed to pull a small miracle and get elected uh, chancellor uh, the last time around. So, you know, he might just catch up in the polls if, uh, you know, it's it's it looks fairly unlikely at this stage. But you you should never exclude anything, um, yeah, in politics. So, so Mats, let me just stick with this for one more minute. Mats is obviously the the presumptive kanzlerkandidat of the Christian Democrats, but I, I thought it was interesting to see that in a 
Forza poll when asked um, if Mertz would be a better chancellor than Scholz, only 35% said yes, compared with 57% who said, percent who said no. And even within the CDU CSU, it seems as if um, Scholz, uh, sorry, as if um, Mertz is at third place after Marco Suda, the minister president of Bavaria, and Hendrik Wüst, the minister president of North Rhine Westphalia. Um, as the the sort of leading candidate that party members want want to to have as chancellor candidate, do you think that Meritz, um is is firmly in the saddle when it comes to leading his party um, over the course of the next year and into the election? I would say two things about this. I think uh, one, the first and most important thing is that it doesn't really matter uh, who the leader is if they're polling at 30 percent and everyone else is polling like below 18. In fact, the IFD is, is the second biggest party at 18 and the IFD is not going to be part of any coalition ever, right. not in, in, in the next few years anyway. So it doesn't really matter. You know, they can put an IKEA furniture piece uh, for for president of the party, and it will it, this this piece will become chancellor. It doesn't really matter. People kind of uh, can't see the forest from the trees when they discuss how how uh, how how mm-hmm. disliked perhaps uh, the current leader Friedrich Merz is. Yeah, he, I mean, it's fair to say he's not he's not necessarily liked by voters by polls. Especially women don't like him in the in the kind of uh, analysis of 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 the of the surveys. Uh, he has this tendency to give an interview and cause and steer a scandal or or kind of turn the media against him and and elicit a lot of criticism. Even when he's right, you know, even on an issue which is not per se controversial, he has this incredible gift to turn it against himself yeah. um, in the public arena. But all of that doesn't matter because, you know, he is at the top of, of the CDU uh, and the CDU, CSU together are at 30 percent. So that's all that you need to know about that. Uh, as as for the possibility of him being kind of cooed away or swept away by some in, in inter-party rebellion, I, I think that's, you know, that's mm-hmm. entirely unlikely. He was just uh, he will be confirmed this week as as a, as a chairman of the party. Yeah, sure. There's another year. There's another. I think there will be another party congress before the election party conference. But that doesn't really matter. It would have to be a really elaborate, powerful plot, Byzantine plot to get rid of him. And I don't see who can perform that plot at a time where they're, you know, they are their next rival. If you exclude the IFD, because like I said, they're not mm-hmm. going in, into government. You know, the SPD is, is half their polling, you know, so he can say, yeah, maybe people don't like me. But we're at thirty, and they're they're and they're at sixteen. So what more do you want, you know? And so yeah. we, we change the captain in 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 uh, of the ship, like just like miles before the finishing line, or you know, what's that saying? You don't change horses midstream. It's I I think it's extremely unlikely, and ever um, even more so that there is no obvious charismatic candidate that would be able to perform this Byzantine intrigue and topple. Mm-hmm. You know the leader. I mean, there is a guy called Hendrik Wüst, uh, who yeah, is from uh, uh, yeah, who, yeah. But uh, I mean, he's a he's a kind of a senior figure in the party, but I think he's never been a senior figure at the federal level. You know, he doesn't have name recognition in Germany. He doesn't have the the kind of that sort of network in the party that would able be able to kind of serve him as 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 a launching pad for a conspiracy yeah. to get rid of. Chairman, so I, I don't really buy that. I think journalists love to write about it because it gives a, gives them an exciting subject matter. But in fact, I think we need to reconcile ourselves with the fact that Mats will is the most likely chancellor. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think you know, obviously, a lot can happen over the course of the next fifteen months or so. Um, but. You know, it is it is highly likely that Merritt yeah, will on be current the, trends. The, yeah, the yeah. Sure. Um, I know that your time is limited, but there's one other topic that I'd like to bring up with you because it's it's kind of breaking news, but it's also part of a a trend um, that we've seen over the past few days. There have been um, a number of attacks on campaign workers for the Social Democrats and the Greens, particularly. Um, this is is. Uh, sort of really come to a head when um, over the weekend, the German social democrat Matthias Eko was assaulted by four men in in Dresden while he was um, out campaigning. Um, And this has raised sort of the fear of far right violence in the run up to the June European parliamentary elections, but also um, 
has created a lot of concern within the parties, um, within the um, Ministry of the Interior about the safety of politicians and campaign workers. Can you talk a little bit about um, what what happened um, to Matthias Ecke and um, how people are responding to this? Yeah, so it was kind of a horrible incident that happened. Uh, he he was attacked. He was assaulted uh, by a group of of, of uh, very young uh, men. Um, they were only identified, I think, as as German men, aged seventeen to eighteen years. Um, I think it was four of them. Uh, one one of them, I think, confessed to to the assault. Um, yeah, so uh, the police is investigating. We'll, we'll see what, what what happened there exactly. Uh, there was a, there was a massive outcry across the political spectrum. You know, people condemned this. Uh, obviously, the Social Democrat condemned. He was a, he is a member of that party, but also today, uh, the leader of the CDU, Friedrich Merz of the Conservative opposition, he condemned it in the strongest of terms. You know, he said this is absolutely unacceptable. Everyone must stand as one uh, in confronting these kind of events, and and I think uh, I think we've had a lot of these minor or even major attacks over the years. I mean, there was even a murder, a political murder uh, uh, that happened uh, quite a few years back. Uh, a, a, a regional kind of official, uh, a, a local politician, was killed. In, in his house or in front of his house by by a far right kind of activist, um, I think even a former neo Nazi, uh, uh, and that was over his welcoming kind of policy to refugees. So uh, I think that's a, there is a latent kind of tendency for for these tensions to to explode in, into political violence. Uh, it has been sort of more or less under control. I mean that that murder is is an outlier and a horrible outlier. Uh, but there have been other attacks, and I think um, the, the the thing is there have been also attacks on on hard right politicians as well. I think I think that the majority of threats come come from or are perceived to come from the far right spectrum, and usually they are somehow associated with the alternative for Germany. Although I don't think in this particular case there is evidence yet that they were somehow linked to this thing. But I think naturally people kind of link that milieu with with the far right violence that you see or, you know, and that can range from kind of verbal violence to cyberbullying to actual physical attacks or assault on property. And all of these things have happened. Uh, the chancellor regularly gets kind of heckled uh, mm -hmm. and insulted at, 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 at various kind of town hall gatherings he does and so on. But we, we, we equally we have seen some some far left people, um, notably some members of a group called Antifa, uh, um, sort of attacking far right activists uh, or or neo Nazis even, and some of these attacks have been quite brutal and ended up with ser serious uh, injury and, and grievous bodily harm. So there is that. I think that that kind of uh, in 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 the in the current. Uh, campaign there, there will be local elections in in some of the eastern uh, lenda. Uh, um, there has been attacks on 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 IFD. I mean attacks when I say attacks, and someone kind of kicked their info, info stand at 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 a kind of a election rally or whatever. And so yeah, there is that tendency. Historically speaking, Germany has had obviously a, a, a nightmarish past related to political violence, and while these things are still you know under control and few and far between there is a very clear tendency and and i think that kind of the tone of the debate is becoming rower i mean this obviously will be familiar to people from yeah. the united states where you know what seems to us extreme here is is in the united states perfectly mainstream nowadays uh in terms of rhetoric at least uh in, in terms, terms of rhetoric of, not in terms of these kinds of attacks yeah right? not, not in terms of political violence but in terms of yeah. rhetoric you know like whether things are, are are being said you know the overtone window yeah. is is much much wider in the united states than it is in germany or in europe in general but uh but yeah that these things have have been have been happening and and i think uh there is a there is a great kind of solidarity between the, the the parties. I mean, they kind of tend to exclude the alternative for Germany, which which mm -hmm. the rest of the parties do not consider a democratic party per se. 
because of some of their positions and some of their rhetoric. So uh, I think, um, but, you know, it, it, it's worth also saying that IFD people have been targets. I mean, well, there has yeah. been a, a physical assault on an IFD person who was kind of knocked out by some far left activist and left lying, you know, on the floor with a broken yeah. nose or whatever. So yeah, there is that, and it has been has been intensifying, I think, over the years. Well, Boyan, I I wish we could keep talking, um, but I know that you have a very important interview to go and conduct, and so um, I just want to say thank you so much for for covering a, a host of foreign policy issues, but also unpacking some domestic issues for us. Um, there is a lot for us to watch and pay attention to. And I hope we can have you back again to continue the conversation. But for now, let me just say many, many thanks to you for taking the time to talk with us today. Thank you. Always a pleasure. And of course, thanks to everybody for tuning in for today's Coffee Pause.